So this past year was a interesting year on the channel. I decided to review less stuff unless it was personally interesting to me. That meant saying no to a lot of things unless I could see myself personally using them. So in this video, this is my list of the favorite bags, parts, bike gear that I tried out this year. Some of it new, some of it old, but all of it I would wholeheartedly recommend. So my friends, this is the most supple gear of 2022. Starting out with bags, it seemed that this year was the year of the rando closure. As you guys know, this is my favorite type of closure on a bike bag because it makes it really easy to get stuff in and out even while you're riding your bike. And it seemed like, at least to me, that more bag companies were starting to implement this. Two bag companies in particular really bubbled up to the top. And the first one is Steady Bag Company. These are handmade in the US, very small batches. For me, it's an awesome size, perfect for long day rides, really similar in size to the Swift Paloma and the Routeworks uh, fancy handlebar bag. But this bag requires no mounts, you just strap it on and you get all that rando goodness in a nice kind of tidy boxy package. The other bag is by a brand called Choiki and they are based in Chile. Uh, and think about it as bike packing meets rando closure. It's larger than the Steady Bag bag, but not as large as say like my Bags by Bird bag. So, so many bags in the names here. It's great for rides where you really have to carry lots of bulky layers or if you're a very lightweight bike packer. One cool thing is that since the review, they've actually implemented some of the suggestions I made, like looping elastic cordage on the front of the bag so you can use that as a kind of quick spot to hold a light jacket. Another bag I really enjoyed was the Elm Bag Works Lil Dude. It's a great bag, it's simple and small. It's perfect for housing tools. And what I love about it is that you can move it very easily from bike to bike to bike. Because of its small size, it doesn't interfere with water bottle cages. And it's also designed for an area on the frame that doesn't change too much. As opposed to bags that are designed around that head tube area, those angles change pretty frequently between frame sizes. Whereas that intersection between the C-tube and the top tube stays fairly consistent, especially uh, among gravel bikes. The, the other bag I really enjoyed, especially when we were in Spain, was this guy. This is the Roadrunner uh, Comrade Packable Backpack. I haven't made a specific video about this, but basically it's a travel backpack that kind of stuffs into a very small bundle. What I love about this specifically is that even though it packs down, it's got a pouch here that will take a full-size water bottle, <clears throat> as well as another quick access pouch here on the outside to put a layer. And it also has a cross chest strap so you can keep it pretty secure. I used this backpack a ton when we were in Girona, uh, carrying groceries, carrying camera gear. It basically felt like a foolish size backpack that packed down really small. So you can see a fairly tidy package about the size of the water bottle. You can squish this down even more if you want to, but you get an almost full size backpack with lots of nice features uh, in, in a package that packs down relatively small. Before we jump into bike parts and other kind of hard goods, if you guys have been enjoying the channel this year, please consider supporting the channel by joining us on Patreon or buying some merch uh, in our store. You guys might have seen that post by our friend Sarah Swallow where Specialized just dumped all its ambassadors with, with very little warning. That is one of our greatest fears and that is why we have avoided a kind of traditional sponsorship model and have always gone direct to the viewers. It's definitely not as sexy as having a big brand behind you and it is very, very, very slow to grow. And it's kind of the equivalent of having a bake sale every month, but in the long term, to my mind, it just seems like the most sustainable. So when I say you guys literally keep the lights on and the video is coming, I mean that quite literally. One piece of gear that won me over is the dropper post by TransX, the jump seat. I, I absolutely love this thing. It's sized for 27.2, so it can fit on a road bike or a gravel bike. And it basically lets you add a dropper post to any bike in a very low stakes configuration. You don't have to deal with any housing or levers that'll clog up your cockpit. Yes, it's a little awkward. You have to reach down at your crotch, but I think it's pretty awesome for the rides out here we have in the West where you're basically climbing for about an hour and descending for 10 minutes. If you ride somewhere where it's super techy and you're constantly going up and down, 
probably not the best for you, but where I ride, it works awesome. It also works great on the trainer. Uh, right now I've got my Bambora on the trainer, both Laura and I use it, and we can quickly change the saddle height just by using the dropper. So let's talk handlebars. The favorite one I tried this year uh, is what's on the hardtack right now, and it is the Harvey Mushman handlebar. There are two things I really like about this handlebar. One is the back sweep at 24 degrees. To me, this gives me a lot of comfort in my wrist, but it's not so angled backwards where I feel like I lose control on technical bits, or at least the technical bits that I ride. The other thing I love about it, and which I think is an emerging trend with these kind of alt bars, is the longer flat section, making it easier to put a bag on the front. I'm actually really excited about this handlebar trend and hope to see other designs that have a longer flat section so you can put handlebar bags. Another bit of gear that I absolutely loved uh, trying out, and yes, full disclosure, we have our own version of it, is the Win Wing Fender by Ass Savers. This is a fender for people who hate fenders. No, they're not as effective as say like a full wraparound uh, fender, but in terms of a clip-on fender, they do pretty dang good. I like how minimal it is and also how easy it is to move from bike to bike to bike. If you're interested in these fenders, we have about 10 more in the shop. I'll put the link in the description below. They also make great travel fenders. I brought them with us to Girona where a full size wraparound fender just wouldn't fit in the bike case. So great use for that as well. Okay, so let's talk brakes. Uh, I'm gonna mention two of them that I really enjoyed using this year. And the first brake is a brake that isn't new, but is new to me and impressed the heck out of me. And that is the Paul Touring Cantilever. That's right, rim brakes are back, baby. And so this year I got the unique opportunity to try out and compare every rim brake uh, that Paul makes, with, with the exception of one. And of all the short pull versions that I tried, the Paul Touring Cannies just hovered up to the top. They offered the best braking power, uh, modulation, clearance, lever feel. They, they do take some time to set up, but I made a whole separate video explaining the best way to set up cantilever brakes. So if you've had cannies in the past and didn't like how they felt or perform, definitely check that video out. I realized in the process of making that video that I didn't really understand how to do it well. But since then, if I were, if I were ever to buy another rim brake bike, I'm definitely putting the Paul Touring Canties on there. The next brake, which was a complete eye-opener, was the Grotac brakes that Velo Orange is importing. <clears throat> These are made in Japan, and they might be the strongest mechanical disc brake I've ever tried. They're deceptively dainty, they have a couple of quirks, but these brakes are just like scary strong. Big, big bonus is that they come in some fun anodized colors. Yes, they cost some money, they're a little bit less expensive than Paul's, and they're just stupid strong brakes. Next bit of gear that I really enjoyed this year, and I'm gonna be honest, I thought it was a gimmick when it first came out, are the Fillmore valves. I fully understand that they're expensive and you can buy a lot of kind of replacement cores before it adds up to the price of a single Fillmore valve. But, but trust me, these are really nice. I haven't had any clogs with mine. And in the same time period, I've had to replace uh, the cores of Laura's bike at least twice. These valves also take out the extra step of removing the core to seat a tire. If you play around with tires a lot, uh, it's just nice to have. I haven't had any clogs. And yeah, it's actually pretty good. Next bit of gear that I have thoroughly enjoyed but haven't made a specific video about it yet is this guy. This is the EE Silk uh, Suspension Seat Post by Cane Creek. I've, I've tried the Connect, I've tried the Redshift Adjustable, I've tried Pro version of the Redshift uh, Suspension Seat Post, and out of all those, this one bubbles up to the top. This one is a shade lighter than the Redshift one. Uh, difference is about 50 grams. And, and what I like about it is that the suspension is fairly subtle, especially with the firmer elastomer inside. I don't like a bobby seat post. This one does a great job at absorbing those surprise uh, large bumps uh, that you may not see, and it feels like a, a punch in the crotch afterwards. And generally speaking, it's not too bobby. Like the only time uh, I notice the seat post has some flex is when riding on a perfectly paved road. There is a little bit of up and down there, but if you're typically riding gravel, you're, you're not gonna notice it. I actually didn't bring this with me to Girona and I regretted it and wish I'd just brought it. 
I didn't realize how accustomed I got to it just sucking up those small hits. One other tangible benefit uh, is that this has a shorter kind of linkage system here when compared to the Redshift on gravel bikes with a level top tube. Because of my short legs, the seat post is really low and this head design lets me get that suspension even on the smaller size bikes that I ride. Yes, it's many, but definitely recommend it. The last bit of gear or tech that I really enjoyed this year isn't directly bike related, but it does make the channel possible. And it is the Insta360 X3 camera. The X3 is an awesome upgrade to the X2, which I use a ton. Image quality is better. It also has some nice AI features, in particular the Mi mode, which kind of motion tracks you so you're always center. This, this reduces the time and post and makes it that much quicker for me to make these videos. Image quality overall is an improvement. It's not quite as good as a GoPro Hero 11, but it does give you a unique angle. That, that GCN look of someone filming you in third person without that GCN budget. Another auxiliary thing is this L bracket mount that our friend Nolan at Bike Sauce made. It allows you to use the X3 in a more natural action cam position. All right, so that was a lot of stuff. I tested a fair amount of gear this year, even though I said no a lot. I thoroughly enjoyed all these things and wholeheartedly recommend them. If you guys have enjoyed the videos I've been making this year, please consider supporting the channel. It means a ton, it helps out a ton, especially in light of all this specialized stuff. It really makes it clear how important it is uh, to support the content you love. Let, let's face it, at the end of the day, most of the bike brands have no interest in this channel. You know, we don't race, we don't podium. We're definitely on the fringe. And I exist because you guys continue to watch, you guys buy stickers, you guys buy merch, and you join us on Patreon. So as always, keep the supple side down.